Okay, right. Based on the four steps that we've already um, outlined earlier on, um, which basically about your clear statement of the amount of money that you wish to acquire and your desire, the time limit for this um, to be gained within, and what you're prepared to give up, and then write your plan. Now, one of the things a lot of people procrastinate on is trying to perfect something. So what we don't want you doing is to sit there, okay, I'm writing my plan, but it's not quite there. It's not, you know, it's not ready. So therefore, I'm not ready to go until I get this right, or the product I've produced, or the course I'm going to produce isn't quite ready. So therefore, I'm not going to release it. Or the book that I've written, I'm not going to you know, because I haven't quite finished with it. Well, let me um, just mention something that I learned years ago from um, Michael Masterson from his book called Ready, Fire, Aim. Uh, it's a fantastic book worth reading. But one of the things in, in there which um, uh, he defines and states uh, over and over again is, look, those people that sit and wait for uh, things to, uh, you know, be perfected and to get them out in the real world, it doesn't happen. Let me give you an example um, of Microsoft, Apple, and other operating systems. Now, when Microsoft, whenever it launches the next version of Windows, do you think they perfected it before they get it out? They've got it to as close as possible. When it's good enough, they roll it out. And how many times have you noticed, and the same goes with Apple and all the rest of them, where you get update after update, because it's an ongoing work in progress. They might have bugs and things, but they're not really going to know what those bugs and things are until they roll it out to the end users and get the feedback from the end users to start fine tuning and making you know, that product or that service better. And the same thing applies for you, ready, fire, aim. If you're going to procrastinate forever in a day, waiting for it to happen, it's not going to happen because you'll never perfect it. Trust me. You know, people have, you know, wasted their whole entire life waiting to perfect something and they'll be in their grave well before they even finalize it. So, you know, don't be one of those people sitting on the fence waiting. Now, well, no, I haven't quite got this right. My logo's not right or my phone number's not right or I haven't got my website or, or you know, get it out there. You can make those final adjustments as you go along. What's your views on uh, Ready Fire Aim, Ben? I have run my life by that, not knowing that it was a concept and that someone was going to write a book with that title, but that's sort of been my whole thing. Oh, great idea. Let's go. Uh, and sometimes I've regretted that, but it beats the heck out of, well, let's study this until we lose all of our enthusiasm <laughs> for it and put it off. And put it off. Somebody, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, somebody said, uh, if when you launch a product or service, it's perfect, you waited too long. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that, that really is true. Uh, I won't put you on the spot. I'll ask the rhetorical question and then pretend like you said, oh, I don't know. Do you know who Gaspar Reinhardt is? No. 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 Gaspar Reinhardt, you know who the Wright brothers are? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Well, right. Gaspar Reinhardt developed and built a flyable airplane two years before the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. But Gaspar fiddled and danced around it and changed this and changed this and kept it hidden in his barn for some period of time, uh, two years for sure, and whatever time it took to get it to that point. So we'll use the figure five for five years. And then one day, however, he got the news, a newspaper, a wire service, and so on. Gaspar Reinhardt read that the Wright brothers had flown at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, USA. So he opened up his barn doors, rolled his flying machine out into a pasture, and he too flew. But he was days late. And you didn't know who Gaspar Reinhardt was. <laughs> so the Wright brothers, they might have dithered around a little bit too, but the Wright brothers 
took action and flew, Gaspar Reinhardt did not. Um, and I have a theory based on all the people, when you're in the cosmetic business, the vitamin business, and a lot of the businesses I've been in, people are always coming to you with their ideas. Uh, some of which are good, some of which are not, some of which I adopted and uh, took off with. But uh, I maintain that many, if not most, I could prove many of the great inventions and ideas of our time will go with their inventors to the inventor's grave. Absolutely. It's, Absolutely. it's in the garage, it's in the work shed, et cetera, whatever, or on their computer or in their mind and whatever. Uh, and, and there it will remain. And the reasons are twofold. Uh, one that I've run into over and over and over again is they're afraid if they tell you about it, you'll steal the idea. <laughs> so they, they can't share it with you. You know, I've had people ask me to invest in something they were doing, but they wouldn't tell me what it was. Because <laughs> if I tell you, <laughs> so if you don't tell me, I'm not investing. You know, well, how can I trust you? Uh, there's that. And then there's the procrastination factor and so on. But I really, some people will die with their great, great idea in a garage and the in-laws and so on who clear up their estate won't understand the value. It's just that crazy old guy who was working on this thing and they will throw it in the landfill, the garbage dump. And that idea will have to wait another 50 or 60 years to be discovered by somebody else independently. Yeah. So yeah, uh, if, if it's perfect, you waited too long and many great ideas, if not most, go with their inventors to their graves. And when you're starting to think that way, remember Gaspar Reinhardt, who most of you haven't heard of until today. Good, good. Okay, just a couple of points before we wind up um, end of chapter one. I just want to basically, um, one of the things that Napoleon Hill um, kept going on about and consistently, whether it was in the Think and Grow Rich or in the Law of Success or many of his other books, was the mastermind. So with that in mind, I think it's so important that when you've written your statement down and you're ready to go out there with your product, your service, whatever it is that you're going to actually be doing over the coming uh, months, years to achieve your goals, Try and find like-minded people that you can confine in. As Ben earlier on said, there's plenty of coaches, mentors out there. They're the ones that you can, you know, people who are on a similar path to yourself. How can you create a mastermind group, mastermind alliance of a group of people that you can meet up weekly, every two weeks, every month, who share ideas and share their failures so you can learn from each other and grow in strength at the end of the day. So in, in reality, there are people out there, you just have to find them. But what I don't want you doing is to procrastinate. Now, procrastination, most people don't really understand what that means and how do you get out of procrastination. Well, let me tell you, procrastination is simply energy bottled up in a bottle, ready to be released. But unfortunately, most people don't have the direction to release the energy that's bottled up. They might have an idea, they might have a concept, they want to do something, but what they don't have is the skill sets or the know-how, know -how, so therefore they keep on procrastinating. So instead of whatever you've been procrastinating on, you feel that you don't have the abilities or you don't have the skill sets, go and find out somebody because you can't be expected to do everything. You're not going to be good at everything. You need people around you. You need to depend on other people and other people need to depend on you. So, you, you know, to release that energy from that procrastination that you've built up, go and find that person who's going to help you to build whatever it is that you need to get to that sort of next level. So procrastination is just energy bottled up waiting for direction. And it might be something that you're useless at. It's like at the moment I'm paid 
um, traffic. I, I'm not very good at it, but you know, I've been procrastinating on that. I've gone with two, three agencies that have failed and let me down, but now we finally got an agency that's helping us with our kind socks to grow. So that was my procrastination for a certain amount, but that was energy that was bottled up, waiting to go, and is finding that who can I give that task or that responsibility to that I can get it off my shoulder so it's no longer slowing me down. So, you know, in reality, what you've got to be doing, another way of putting ready, fire, and aim is I would say, you know, you really need to be ready, fire, and game on with your new way of thinking, new way of doing with the think and grow rich applied. So, you know, what's your game on? Ready, fire, game on. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to be winding down this now. So I'm going to let Ben finish off what his opinion on this that you should be doing now after today's first chapter of Think and Grow Rich applied about desire and getting your goals. So Ben, how can you uh, not just motivate these people that are listening to this um, um, webinar and podcast to take action rather than to procrastinate or to think that they haven't really perfected it, um, that they're still sitting on the fence and not going. So what would you say to get people off to a start now rather than tomorrow or next week or next month? Well, here's my uh, A copy of Thinking Grow Rich signed by Dr. Napoleon Hill in 1945 when I was three and uh, never opened, by the way. I'm not going to open it because the lady who owned it for 75 years never did. I want to leave it like that. But I read my first copy, which was given to me September 5th, Wednesday, September 15th, 1965 in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, by the person who brought me into the cosmetic business. He said, you're young, you're going to need some help. He handed me two things, a beat up old copy of Thinking Real Rich and uh, a record called The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. He said, listen to this, read this. You need to grow up quickly. I was 23 at the time. So I did, and I read it, and I could have probably pass some sort of basic test on thinking the rich. I read about the mastermind group and so on, but I didn't get it. I didn't know I didn't get it until a few years later when Dr. Hill came to work for me, with me, for me, whatever. We were paying him, so I guess he worked for me. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and I was, I was complaining when I uh, came to work at Holiday Magic, there was no office for me because they weren't. They still had a president who didn't know he'd, he'd been removed. My revival, arrival was not good news for him. And uh, so I said, well, I'll just sit in here. So I, went, I got a chair, looked like an executive chair, put it halfway down the conference table in the conference room. And I said, this is my office. And that's where I sat for the next several years. And Dr. Hill's chair became to my left at the end of the conference table. Every day, people would gather, come in with their various uh, concerns and complaints all day, every day. And so I said to Dr. Hill, you know, the, the legal department didn't like what the advertising department was doing. The advertising department couldn't stand the legal department and couldn't understand why the production department couldn't generate the products that they had dreamed up in their mind with no idea of what it takes to come up with a product. Um, and the financial guy didn't trust anybody, including me, uh, because we were all trying to take the company's money and do stupid things with it. And so I was sitting there and it reminded me of my father. He had six brothers and sisters who fought among themselves constantly, but nobody fought with my dad for some reason. They all called him to complain about the other one. So when this started, when I came to California, this started, I thought, oh, I've seen this before. It's called dad's family. Um, they don't like each other. They're always at each other, always ratting each other out. So I was whining to Dr. Hill about it one day. I said, I, I, half my day is tied up listening to other people's problems about other people on the team. He said, when's the last time you had them all up to the house uh, for a cocktail party? I said, well, I never have, have frankly off the record years later, most of them weren't people I would want to spend a lot of time with at the house. <laughs> they, they did their job well, but being a friendly, wonderful human being may not have been one of their traits. 
I said, well, not really ever. He said, when was the last time you got them all together other than a board meeting with you going, where you're going over financial statements where you just got together and shared ideas? And I said, well, I really haven't done that with him yet. He said, here's an idea. He said, have you ever read Think and Grow Rich? Well, he knew I had. <laughs> you know? I said, yeah. And he said, well, you must have missed the part about masterminding. What you have here is a mastermind, all, all the pieces of a mastermind that have not been pulled together in a cohesive manner and turned into a mastermind group. So A, let's make them all friends. Let's have them up to the house and have an icebreaker. Then when they come to your office for their weekly meeting, uh, uh, which I said, I don't have a weekly meeting. So you're going to now, <laughs> when they come to your weekly meeting and sit around this table, they won't be fighting with one another. And do they ever attack each other personally one-on-one? -on -one? I said, no, no, only to me. <laughs> do they tell me what a no good SOB that the other one is? He says, great, well, we'll turn them into friends and that won't be a problem anymore. And then we'll start throwing problems out that you know the legal department may not know anything about, but they're smart people. They became attorneys, they went to college, they went to law school, they're not dummies. So we throw out a problem on the table and we all dig in and let's see what people can do. Mo, that was the day we started the rapid ascent from a successful cosmetic company, mid-sized, two, three-year-old company at that point, to a million dollar a day, the largest direct sales multi-level marketing company in the world. I had them up to the house. They found out that Bill Brogan, the, the uh, buyer, chief buyer for the company, wasn't a no good, grumpy old man. He was an ex-Marine, and that's what he was paid to do as a Marine, be a grumpy old guy. Uh, he didn't mean it. He was as nice a person as you ever met. And uh, some of the people who were very intelligent and hard to approach, they were doing it defensively because they weren't good social people. But when we made them a team of friends, and threw a problem in the middle of the table, they solved it like that. Most times before that meeting was over, unless somebody had to go get some information and report back next week. So we turned a team of enemies into a team called a mastermind group that solved problems you can't imagine. To this day, Mo, I consider a mastermind group cheating because they can do so quickly what I could never do or think of, or it would take 10 years instead of an hour and a half uh, to solve that I honestly feel like I'm getting away with something, knowing the secret of a mastermind group. I use that, by the way, when I became attitude coach for the astronauts, Apollo 15, 16, 17. When I went down and spent the weekend with the launch test supervisor of the manned space program, Jim Harrington, his wife stayed with him. They had a party. It turned out it was in honor of me, but I didn't know that till it got underway. Uh, it was the night before Apollo 14 launched and 13, as you recall, blew up on the way to the moon and had to be rescued in one of the great feats of mankind. 14 had uh, morale problems, Alan Shepard, astronaut Alan Shepard was on the microphone talking to the group, come on launch team, we're with you and you're with me and let's all, because he didn't want, he, he's the one who said he, he, the worst part about being an astronaut was being launched into space on a vehicle that had been put together by the lowest bidder. And so I sensed in getting to meet some of these people that the astronauts were the heroes, you know, the silk scarves around the neck, and they all were given back in those days a Corvette to drive by the local Chevrolet dealer. One was red, one was white, one was blue, the American colors. They were the movie stars, the untouchables, the guy who put it all together and made it come together as a team and launched it, Jim Harrington, the launch test, the launch test supervisor of the manned space program, barely except from work knew any of these people and uh, so I remembered what Dr. Hill had taught me with a group of people who couldn't stand one another and all the problems we solved once they became a mastermind group 
I said to Jim, let's, uh, and to the heads of NASA at the time, I said, here's an idea. Let's turn these people into friends. So when they're sending up a, a rocket and Jim Irwin, commander of Apollo 15 is on it, that's not astronaut Jim Irwin, that's Uncle Jim. And dad, you better put that rocket together properly because Uncle Jim is on it and turn them into a team. And masterminding came to NASA, to the American Manned Space Program. Dr. Hill didn't know about the Manned Space Program and they probably haven't heard of Dr. Hill, but Dr. Hill solved many of the problems at NASA with the Apollo program. And they continue it, by the way, to this day. There are programmed gatherings where the superstars and the little nerd in the corner who's designing programs on his computer come together, hang out, and become buddies and solve problems together. Excellent. Excellent. I, th I think one of the uh, things that uh, viewers, listeners um, to this podcast webinar uh, need to alleviate themselves of the fear that um, I'm of the wrong background, I'm of the wrong education, I haven't got that education, I haven't come from the right side of town, or I'm in the wrong country, or, you know, I had poor parents, I had a poor upbringing, all of that, or, you know, on this religion or this color, that has absolutely nothing to do with it, apart from what you believe yourself what you've got to understand um, when Ben and myself talking about mastermind groups is because you've all been duped and brainwashed by the old education system, which is antiquated. I mean, from the moment you go to your uh, primary school, secondary school, college, university, what are you told to do? You're told to sit on your own. You know, you can't use a calculator. You can't use a computer. You can't talk to anybody else. That's classed as cheating. Well, if most of your life of learning consisted of that you can't talk to people and then you come into the real world, all of a sudden, like, you know, you, got, you can use a computer, you can use a calculator, you can use the mobile phone, you can use the internet, and you can talk to people to share ideas, to learn from. And it's not an embarrassment. It's nothing like that in the real world. So you need to get used to it. I don't care what age you are and you listen to this webinar or the podcast. You know, you can turn to people, ask for help and learn because that's what they're there for. Having a group of like-minded people with same sort of goals as yourself, you know, you can share ideas, share what's working, what's not working, what works one industry doesn't necessarily work. It, it doesn't stop you from taking it to your industry and making it work. Cross-pollination is a fantastic way of finding out what works in that industry. If a farmer's doing something up there and I, I'm manufacturing cups, you know, what can I learn from the farmer? What can the farmer learn from me? So all these things will help you to cross pollinate your own ideas to get you going instead of sitting there thinking about it, saying you're not ready. So ready, fire, game on. You know, we're at the end of chapter one. So if you're not ready to go, and trust me, if you were anywhere near here, I would boot you in the behind to get you going. Ben, final words, my friend, to the end of the first chapter. Well, you were talking about education and, and uh, having lack of education, lack of experience and so on. Not to brag, to turn myself in as a potential failure in the making. Uh, I went to public school in Atlanta, Georgia. At the end, at the end of the halfway through the eleventh grade, they said to my parents, uh, we, "We think Ben would benefit by going somewhere else." I think they were talking about reform school, <laughs> but Dad had a little money, so I wound up in a private school, St. Andrews, or an Episcopalian school in the mountains of Tennessee. Uh, the monks and I didn't get along well, so I'm, now I'm thrown out of a public school in Atlanta or encouraged to leave. I go to this school. After about a year and a half, I uh, ingratiated myself to the disciplinary committee, and they threw me out. Uh, Dad said, that's like being thrown out of prison. 
I sent you to a high class reform school and they threw you out. How is that possible? Uh, so I am a high school graduate, barely. That's 12 grades in the United States, barely. And really only because the laws of the state of Georgia say you have to be in school until you're some age. And that was roughly corresponding with the end of the 12th year. So I just happened to be there when my class graduated. I then went to college. I was elected president of my freshman class. I lasted in college three weeks. I can get my hand worse, just three, three weeks. I was elected president, but I didn't get sworn in because I dropped out before they could swear me in. So I have, I'm a high school graduate, barely. Uh, I was running a large cosmetic company and various other sundry things. With I, did, I didn't know how to read a profit and loss statement. I didn't know how to read a balance sheet. Probably was still struggling with balancing my own checkbook. But intuitively, I've always gathered around people, gone out of my way to meet interesting people. I've met some of the most interesting people that have been alive uh, in this era because I went out of my way to meet them. You can too. They're waiting for you. They want to be your buddy. And I've worked with astronauts. I worked with Charlie Manson, the mass murderer. He didn't really murder anybody, but he caused other people to murder people. Charlie Manson. I've been in his cell at San Quentin, locked in with him for nine hours. I learned a lot from him. By the way, the only book in his cell, his most famous, most favorite book, couldn't have built the Manson family without it was How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. So, uh, and I had spent a lot of time talking about that with him. Uh, he formed a mastermind group of killers, but nevertheless, a mastermind group. And they set goals and they went out and achieved them. And then I met a guy named Jay Maxwell who lived next door to some property we bought when we moved up here. Jay had a third grade education very few teeth. Uh, I'm not sure. I know he couldn't read. And other than his signature, I don't think he could write. I learned as much from Jay Maxwell, talking to him down by the fence, because he was close to the earth. He had no airs. He had no ego about him. He just knew life as it came. And he was in farming and pig raising and so on. So, you know, the, that area of the of knowledge is replete with uh if you understand that you reap what you sow then that is applicable in business it's applicable in your personal life so he was sort of the one of those well if you plant it and water it and take care of it it grows type philosophers i learned as much from jay maxwell in an informal way lean up against a fence as i did from dr hill or anybody else they say when the teacher is ready, the student, uh, when, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. That's because the teachers are all around you all the time, always have been, always will be. Perhaps today we can make the decision to open up ourselves to that teaching, to forming informal and formal mastermind groups, to get, get the cumulative wisdom of the people you have access to. And all of the great teachers uh, of the world that have departed and you didn't get to meet them, they wrote books or books were written about them. All of that information is available. Proof, real quick, maybe at a future session, we can spend a little time on it. This is one of our adopted sons. His name is Lamont Bowens. I met him when I was teaching a public speaking class at Lompoc, the federal penitentiary. Also, Eight, I also taught at San Quentin for five years. He was a 19-year-old high school dropout. That's assuming he ever dropped in. I'm not sure that he did, but I know he didn't graduate because we helped him get his GED, which in America is the equivalent of a high school diploma. And then we guaranteed his college loan when he decided to want to go to college. Never had to pay a dime, but we guaranteed it. And then he announced he wanted to go to law school and he went to law school and graduated. We guaranteed that, never had to pay a dime. And Lamont today is a successful practicing attorney with three offices scattered across the United States. And I just wrote a letter of recommendation for him for a judgeship. 
Lamont Bowens, high school dropout, drug dealer, gangbanger, who was in a gunfight with his stepfather at one point in his life, is about to be a judge. If Lamont Bowens can achieve it, trust me, you can. Excellent. Great words to end by. Right, guys, um, this is the end of chapter one, and we look forward to seeing you guys all together on chapter two. So don't go away. Just follow us on uh, Facebook, and you'll get all the videos in blocks of 20 minutes that will be coming out. And let's see and get the feedback from there. Take care. Farewell, everyone. Thank you for that. Thank you.